Russia and China, two of the world's largest superpowers, are drawing closer together. Through joint military exercises, mega infrastructure projects, and a united front against American protectionism. I respect China and I respect President Xi, but they've been killing us. Amid escalating tensions between China and the U.S. over the trade war, Moscow and Beijing have strengthened their relations with a strategic partnership. And I'm here in Russia to examine the nature of this geopolitical alliance and its impact for the rest of the world. A Belt and Road initiative linking China and Russia has sparked celebration and concern. Rival powers, Russia and China, Russia and with China. Russia or China? In my journey along the road to Russia, I'll visit China's border cities with Russia. This entire city is lit in gold. I'll discover the splendors of Mongolia with its untapped riches. It's like a house on wheels. Yeah. Mysterious Uzbekistan through its stunning cities. And I'll explore the Kremlin and the power it wields. This is my journey through one of China's key economic corridors on its Belt and Road. I've been traveling along one of China's key economic corridors, and I've arrived at the end of the line, in Russia. Today, Russia and China have what they call a strategic partnership. There's lots that Moscow and Beijing work together on, but defense and trade are at the heart of it. In exchange for Russia's valuable resources, China has been providing its neighbor with advanced machinery and technology, including the tools to develop a 5G network. It has also invested billions of dollars in Belt and Road projects across the country. I'm about to check out two of Beijing's latest contributions to the country. Russian President Vladimir Putin has even described them as being able to make him smile. These two are what the fuss is all about. Ruyi and Ding Ding, the latest additions to Moscow Zoo, who made their debut here four months ago. Flown in all the way from China, they are here on a 15-year loan, one that involves a considerable investment on the zoo's part. Having these cute, cuddly creatures comes at a hefty price. The zoo has to pay China a million US dollars annually for the next 15 years. And that's not including the millions they have to spend to maintain these enclosures and the cost of importing bamboo. Sounds like quite a lot to bear just for two bears. Even then, Svetlana Akulova, the zoo's director, has taken quite a liking to the furry foreigners. <laughs> what are the challenges you think you'll encounter raising the pandas here outside of China. Given all the money that you spent to prepare for the arrival of the pandas and the millions more that you'll have to spend, 
Are you confident that you will break even? Начнем с того, что вообще этот проект привоза этих животных в нашу коллекцию это не является финансовым каким-то объектом или финансовым проектом. Это совершенно другое для нас. Это научный опыт и сотрудничество между нашими коллегами Китая и Россией. Today there are only 27 zoos outside China that have pandas. China reserves the animals exclusively for countries it deems as being friendly. For centuries, it sent pandas to sweeten relations with its allies. But recently, panda diplomacy is stirring up some unexpected controversy. Shortly before Ruyi and Dingding's unveiling at Moscow Zoo, the arrival of pandas to another zoo in Copenhagen, Denmark, sparked an outcry. At the heart of the protests, a concern that the panda gifts would taint the government's position on China, especially on issues like human rights in Tibet. More recently, the birth of twin panda cubs in Germany also triggered debate regarding the country's position on the 2019 Hong Kong protests. In Russia, the pandas don't quite carry the same sort of baggage. В российской культуре то, что происходит внутри страны, всегда остается внутри страны. И Российская Федерация не может вмешиваться во внутриполитические процессы в Китае. Во-вторых, признаться честно, у меня складывается такое ощущение, что большая часть российского населения вообще никак не воспринимает принятие панд московским зоопарком. В Китай направил панд, мы приняли, спасибо большое, очень интересно. The Russian reception to the pandas speaks much about relations between Russia and China in recent times. The ties are good, and good ties are good for business. In 2014, Russian and Chinese companies pooled together over $100 million to set up the Russia-China Business Park in St. Petersburg. It's 10 hectares large, the size of 20 football fields. Chen Chekang runs the place. He's showing me what he feels is its centerpiece, a permanent exhibition dedicated to China's Belt and Road. One Belt, One Road wine. It only took me five seasons to find this. Can we, can we break this open? I think this calls for a celebration. How does your park help Chinese businesses set up their companies here in Russia? How does your park contribute to China's new Silk Road plans? Can Many of these important conversations happen at Chun Chi Huang, a restaurant located right at the center of the park. Named after China's first emperor, it aims to provide a regal setting for political and business discussions. Over the past 15 years, foreign direct investment into Russia has averaged over $5 billion annually, reaching a record high of $40 billion in 2013. So, this huge dining hall is where many important deals get inked. And business is thriving. I came here expecting just another industrial park, like the ones I visited over the past five years exploring the new Silk Road. But instead of offices and factories, this place is mostly exhibition halls. At its core, there's a strong focus on promoting cross-cultural understanding between the Russians and Chinese. After a walk through the exhibits explaining China's Belt and Road Initiative, 
Russian visitors will get to the softer aspects of China's global mega plan. For example, they can immerse themselves in different Chinese art forms, from calligraphy to music and martial arts. For special business guests, Yin Lai, the wife of Mr. Chen, even conducts tea appreciation courses. It's just one of the soft power cells that Chinese make to promote business, friendships, and an understanding of Chinese culture. That's a lot of work for two small cups of tea. Yes, we drink tea not just for the taste of the tea, but also for the taste of the tea. It's also a very pleasant process. That's good. That's good. Okay. Good. 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 The Chinese who work in St. Petersburg also experience a fun way of learning the Russian language through Russian opera. Very nice, very nice. Why is promoting cross-cultural relations important for your company? Uh,确实缺乏这个基础设施。所以中国之间的现在交流交流到今天这个程度呢,不仅在贸易,投资,甚至有更多的在人文领域里面,都需要这么一个社会平台,能为两国的这种啊,企业提供呢,这个综合性
Why is the 6th Chinese Communist Party Congress in 1928 such an important event for the Chinese? Chinese-Communist-Party 所以说它具有非常重要的意义，对于中国人民来讲呢，也非常重要。Recently, there is a trend of red tours where Chinese tourists go to visit sites and learn about the shared communist history between China and Russia. In your view, why do these Chinese tourists go on these tours? 好多中国游客在他们小的时候啊，通过各种渠道，比如说大人的这个口述。或者课本的介绍，了解了这些历史，对他们呢非常感兴趣。但是呢，由于种种原因，就没有法到实际的这个地方来看一看。那么现在呢，中俄两国关系非常友好，两国之间的交通啊也是非常方便。那么好多中国
Are you concerned that if the swine flu dies down and the issues surrounding the trade war are resolved, that Russia may potentially lose China as a customer? Oh, I don't think so, because we have a lot of products uh, here which are in high demand in China, and we hope very much that we will have an opportunity to send to export pork to China as well. We talk about uh, pork feet, uh, pork uh, ears, stomachs, etc., which are not in high demand here in Russia. So once we have a base of uh, consumers in China, I think that uh, we are going to continue uh, to export uh, swine fever or not. Beefing up its neighbor's meat supply isn't the only way Russia has been working with its neighbor to get through the trade war. When the U.S. and its allies closed its doors to Huawei over allegations of espionage, Russia welcomed the company with open arms. Just recently, the Chinese tech giant joined forces with the Russians to develop a 5G network in the country. Huawei was a casualty of the ongoing trade dispute between China and the U.S. By welcoming Huawei to collaborate with a Russian firm, MTC, what message is Russia sending? Первое, я хотел бы обратить ваше внимание на то, что американское противодействие китайской компании Huawei — это не только торговля или экономика, это борьба за будущие новые рынки сбыта цифровой продукции. Прежде всего я говорю о развитии э, сетей 5G, а также развитии такого сегмента, как интернет вещей. Америка борется, применяя политические и экономические механизмы, за влияние на этот будущий рынок. Китай предоставляет альтернативу китайскому американскому оборудованию. То, что Huawei сотрудничает с российской компанией МТС, означает, что данное сотрудничество экономически выгодно российской компании. While the Russians do not appear to be concerned about issues surrounding artificial intelligence and high-tech partnerships, I wonder if their commitment to these partnerships will be affected by changing global political winds. If the U.S. eventually softens its approach on China, will this have an impact on the current collaborations between Russia and China? Во-первых, хочу заметить, что, по моему мнению, даже ослабление американского давления на Китай не изменит в корне ситуацию. Китай и США вступили в период активной конкуренции. В связи с тем, что и экономика Китая, и экономика США очень сложная и многоукладная, в каких-то сегментах этих экономик мы будем наблюдать сотрудничество или кооперацию. В других сегментах мы будем наблюдать соперничество и конкуренцию. То же самое и с Российской Федерацией. Нельзя сказать, что, допустим, изменение американской позиции по отношению к Китаю приведет к ухудшению российско-китайских отношений. Нет, они не ухудшатся. Китай точно так же продолжит сотрудничество с Российской Федерацией. Мы являемся стратегическими партнерами. Никакого изменения я не ожидаю. The reality is, China views Russia as much more than a trading partner. Russia's strategic location makes it a vital bridge for China to connect both the Arctic and Eurasia with the broader New Silk Road. I'm in Tula, Russia's armament hub. The town has a strong 300-year-old tradition of making weapons, beginning with swords and muskets in the 1700s. Today, it continues to produce some of the most advanced arms in the world. Some of that is on display here at this museum, which also has some fun war games. Yes! All right. Oh my 
my gosh, this feels pretty lifelike. But the town is now looking to diversify its economy and apply their metalwork skills to other products. Like cars, for example. The local government is looking to turn Tula into a hub for manufacturing. Tula has plenty of suitable labor and the land to go along with it. This attracted Great Wall Motors, China's largest SUV producer, to set up a car factory here, making it the biggest Chinese investment in Russia's manufacturing industry. And I have to say, I'm pretty excited to be one of the first to check out this state-of-the-art SUV plant, which consists of some of China's latest and most advanced manufacturing technology. Pretty cool opportunity. These high-tech robots are working alongside Russian workers to assemble Great Wall Motors flagship product, the Havel, a mid-sized SUV. It's currently one of the most popular automobile brands in Russia. To meet the high demand, the company intends to produce 150,000 Havel cars by 2020 right here in this plant. I tour the factory with Deputy Director Ivan Dushkin. It's been reported that your current production capacity is 80,000 cars a year, but you intend to up this to 150,000 by 2020. How do you plan on doing this? We think that our cars are very innovative and well in service. So we think that our cars are going to like our people, our market, our market, and in the future, the production will increase due to a good production. Why did your company set up a factory here in Tula, and what are the benefits of operating here? The government of Tula, in the head of the governor of Tula, to whom I have a special thanks, has made such conditions for running a business that they just didn't leave us a chance, except for how to come here to Tula. They gave us and the legal and the legal and the legal and the help of the staff personnel and other conditions that allowed us to develop and produce here in the quality of production. By setting up its operations here, the company has created jobs for more than 1,000 workers, 90% of whom are Russians from the Tula region. I'm curious to hear from the staff about what it's like to work in China's first overseas vehicle manufacturing plant, where entire cars are assembled from scratch. What are the benefits of working here? Работа здесь открывает перспективы работы, опыта работы именно с перспективным китайским производителем, а одним из крупнейших в данной отрасли. Most of the operations here involve robots and advanced machines. Are you at all afraid that as your company upgrades its equipment, that one day you may be at risk of losing your job? Несмотря на высокий уровень автоматизации, да, все равно сборка и производство автомобилей всегда будет требовать именно ручного квалифицированного труда, да. Несмотря на это, ну, как, у меня нет переживаний на, на этот счет. Я считаю, что всегда будут необходимы люди, которые будут управлять и совершенствовать этот процесс, потому что автомобили должны улучшаться. Its expansion to Russia cost Great Wall Motors more than 500 million dollars. But its yield is expected to be over four times more, at $2.6 billion. It's projects like these that remind Russia how much it has benefited from Chinese investment over the past five years. In 2014, Moscow was slapped with tough sanctions by the U.S. and its allies, following its annexation of Crimea. At a time when countries were closing their doors to Russia, China chose to buck the trend. It helped soften the impact of the sanctions on Russia's population by pumping billions of dollars into its neighbor. America and Europe were unimpressed. In return, Russia granted the Chinese access to its prized energy sector. Я бы сказал, что это мудрое действие не только по отношению к Китаю, но и по отношению к другим странам, потому что Россия дала доступ в энергетические проекты не только Китаю, но еще Японии, Европейскому Союзу и даже некоторым американским компаниям. 
то, что китайские инвесторы участвуют в российских проектах, как раз является подтверждением того, что российская и китайские экономики взаимодополняемые. И то, что китайские инвесторы вкладывают свой капитал в российские проекты, позволяет России разрабатывать новые месторождения, месторождения газа и экспортировать этот газ на мировой рынок. The Chinese and the Russians are now in the business of distributing power, but not in the political sense. Shipping and energy companies from both sides are involved in a mega collaboration to extract and export liquefied natural gas from Russia's Arctic region. Most of this liquefied natural gas, or LNG, comes from Russia's Yamal Peninsula, which holds one-fifth of the country's natural resources. Through several state-run enterprises, China currently owns a 30% stake in this LNG plant, which is capable of producing 57 million tons of natural gas a year. It's just one of several projects China has embarked on in the Arctic. In the past few years, it has invested heavily in expeditions, research centers, and icebreakers as part of a grand strategy to develop a polar silk road. These plans are driven by Beijing's desire to dominate the Northern Sea Route, a maritime corridor which has recently become more accessible due to climate change. Although the route flows along Russia's Arctic coast, Moscow has encouraged China's ambitions. Why does Russia support China's plan to, to develop an Arctic Silk Road? Китай заявил, что он готов разрабатывать проект под названием «Ледяной шелковый путь». Планы Китая как раз совпадают с планами Российской Федерации по организации навигации и перевозки различных товаров по Северному морскому пути, который проходит через территориальные воды России. The Northern Sea Route is a disputed area. Will this affect China's Polar Silk Road plans? Северный морской путь который проходит по территории, по территориальным водам Российской Федерации, никем не оспаривается. Он принадлежит Российской Федерации. Поэтому на планы Китая территориальные претензии никак не повлияют. Здесь вопрос в другом, в объеме необходимых инвестиций для того, чтобы организовать этот северный морской путь. Инвестиции нужны очень большие. Российская Федерация не может справиться одна, поэтому, естественно, она заинтересована в том, чтобы китайские инвесторы вкладывали деньги в развитие северного, российского северного морского пути. From thwarting America's attempts to weaken their economies, to joining forces to dominate the Arctic, Sino-Russian cooperation is extensive. And it's an alliance that's been strengthened by the close friendship between both countries' presidents. But it remains to be seen if this personality-based diplomacy can survive the test of time. I'm in St. Petersburg. Russia's second largest city. It's famous for its rivers, which are flanked by neoclassical buildings, vestiges of a bygone era. It's also the hometown of Vladimir Putin. The Russian president was all too happy to show his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping around when he made his eighth state visit to Russia this year. They shared a private cruise along this very river and even visited Mr. Putin's alma mater, where the Chinese president received an honorary doctorate. But that may not have been the highlight of President Xi's tour. There was one attraction that he was especially eager to visit. This is the Aurora a decommissioned Russian war cruiser which is over a hundred years old. While many Russians today view the ship as just another landmark of the city, it holds a special significance among the Chinese. On board the ship in October 1917, the crew of the Aurora launched a mutiny against their captain, a Tsar loyalist. After killing him and taking over the ship, they fired a shot from one of their cannons. 
This event marked the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution. Some Chinese still today celebrate this event as bringing communism to China. What's the significance of President Xi and Putin's visit to the ship? Большая честь, еще раз повторю, и это лишнее подтверждение тому, что наши руководители уделяют внимание, как у нас замечательные отношения между странами сложились. Why is this ship so important to the Chinese? Я хочу сказать, что ваши соотечественники, они очень трепетно относятся к кораблю, как и по-прежнему его называют кораблем революции. Потому что Великая Октябрьская социалистическая революция, символом которой Аврора достаточно долгое время являлась при советской власти, эту страницу истории не выбросить. И корабль участвовал, и экипаж участвовал в февральских и октябрьских событиях 1917 года. Поэтому для китайского народа он является символом революции, символом октября. Собственно говоря, они к этой дате относятся очень трепетно. И в 17 году, в 2017, когда мы праздновали столетие, здесь просто паломничество было китайских туристов. И мы, на самом деле, очень рады принимать ваших соотечественников у нас на борту. But China's interest in Russian military vessels is not confined to just history. In recent years, Moscow has been equipping Beijing with its most advanced weapons and military vehicles. They also hold regular joint military exercises on a massive scale, the biggest of which was the 2018 Vostok War Games held across Siberia and Russia's Far East. With nearly 300,000 troops, as well as thousands of aircraft, ships, and tanks, it was the biggest military drill since the Cold War. These recent developments underscore a major geopolitical shift. The two countries, which used to regard each other as military rivals, are extending their cooperation beyond economics to defense as well. I managed to witness the closeness between the two militaries firsthand. While traveling around St. Petersburg, I chanced upon a Chinese missile destroyer that had docked here. It's been invited to mark Russia's Naval Day, one of the few foreign ships to participate in the celebrations. Это означает, что между Россией и Китаем есть и развивается стратегическое партнерство. Это означает, что мы два крупнейших соседа. Это означает, что мы доверяем друг другу. Это означает, что мы готовы защищать свои собственные территории, в том числе и военными средствами. Concerns have emerged in the US and Europe over a China-Russia alliance and the potential for the two giants to form a formidable geopolitical bloc by integrating the Eurasian Economic Union, or EAEU, with the Belt and Road Initiative. The EAEU is made up of Russia, Armenia, Belarus, along with Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. Во-первых, Российская Федерация поддерживает планы Китая по реализации китайской инициативы одного пояса одного пути. Мы подписали несколько документов, которые направлены на интеграцию разных форм интеграции между нашими, между нашими странами, я имею в виду Россию и Китай, и другими странами, которые принимают участие в китайской инициативе. Здесь и логистические центры, и промышленность. И составные части одного пояса, одного пути, такие как космический шелковый путь, цифровой шелковый путь, транспортный шелковый путь, промышленный шелковый путь и так далее. Понятно, что российские экономисты изучают в том числе и критику китайской инициативы. Например, широко обсуждаемая проблема долговой ловушки. Но мы приходим к выводу, что пока опасения западных экономистов преувеличены. Есть другая проблема – эффективности проектов. Maybe one potential way of the thinking about the China and Russia relations is perhaps uh, both these two countries will be in a block. Uh, maybe some other countries, for example, your, uh, United States and Europe, they will be in another blocks 
which means there will be some more confrontation between two blocks. Once this kind of uh, uh, thinking, I mean, uh, to, to shape the international order in future, I think that will be a, a tragedy for, for the international order because both China and also, I believe, also for Russia, we don't want to go back to so-called Cold War period. So we need to try, you know, every kind of effort to stop any kind of this um, uh, trend. On the other side, I think that, uh, yes, uh, for China, uh, it needs to take a consideration how could China to keep the balance between the different uh, uh, partnerships. For example, uh, for China, the Russia, Europe, and there were some other uh, uh, players. Uh, all of them are very important partners with China. Both China and Russia say they are committed to a multilateral approach and are not pursuing a geopolitical bloc. In the meantime, the presidents of both countries have already committed to implementing the BRI in a new era of Sino-Russian cooperation. They've met nearly 30 times in the past six years. Their close friendship has been widely regarded to be the pillar of the strategic partnership. But I wonder whether personality-based diplomacy is a durable basis for long-term relations between two countries which have no unifying links, such as culture. I discussed this with Gong Jiajia, a senior executive at the Chinese embassy in Russia. Do you think that the two countries will continue to remain close and in good relations even after the two presidents are no longer in power? Kanagan 这是两国人民的选择，因为只有这样子，我们两国可以共同的这个大家携手繁荣，共同的发展。我想这是两国老百姓、两国人民共同的心愿. What is the Chinese government doing to ensure that the bilateral relations uh, remain strong for the long term? 中国政府呢，我们确实是对俄罗斯的这个关系发展，我们认为是一个。对中国来讲是非常重要的Initiatives to promote cooperation between the younger generations of Russians and Chinese are already in place, especially in the education sector. I visit Lomonosov University, Russia's most prestigious college. Lomonosov's sister institute is the Beijing Institute of Technology, and together they run joint campuses in both Russia and China. The Russian campus is home to a huge Chinese exchange student population of 2,000, one of the highest in the world. Chinese leaders like Mao Zedong and Wen Xiaobao made speeches from this very campus, which demonstrates the high level of engagement this Russian university has enjoyed with China in the past. Until today, this school remains committed to promoting strong relations between the two countries. The school's joint programs with China are run by former Deputy Prime Minister Sergei Shakrai. How would you say that your university is helping to promote long-term bilateral relations with China? Well, I want to 
что совместный университет — это не просто образование, это самая современная наука, и это э, цивилизация, русская культура, китайская культура. У нас в совместном университете центр русского языка, центр обучения учителей китайского языка из России, которые там проходят стажировку, центр обучения китайских гидов, которые работают в России. То есть это центр сопряжения двух культур и двух цивилизаций. И в этом, наверное, главная изюминка. До создания университета в Китае было 63 школы с русским языком. Сегодня их уже 120. Совместный университет — окно в Россию. И окно из России в Китай. Мы уже будем развиваться сами. И этот университет — хороший плацдарм российско-китайских отношений. I conclude my journey at St. Petersburg's Palace Square. It's the site of the famous Bolshevik Revolution, which deposed the Tsar and triggered the spread of communism to China. While the Chinese continue to use the past to reinforce ties with their neighbor, they're also constantly looking towards the future. And across my four-country journey along the Russia-China Economic Corridor, I've had the opportunity to experience the various collaborations that are helping safeguard Beijing's long-term interests in the region. At the end of it all, I've come to realize that the engagements between Russia and China are a little different from other collaborations I've observed along the new Silk Road. It goes beyond soft power, hard infrastructure and investment. The strategic partnership between the two countries represents a long-standing commitment to be allies in a contested world. <laughs>